thank you everybody for inviting me. Uh, I, I miss what the uh, Caliphate has introduced. Uh, but basically, uh, I'm a landscape architect by training uh, and also a civil engineer. Uh, I've been practicing for the last 30 years, uh, landscape architecture mainly. And uh, it's amazing for me to come to Dhaka today. Uh, there's a lot of firsts for me. Uh, first time in Dhaka, first time in Bangladesh always wanted to come. First time I'm, a, I'm on stage barefooted, I love it. And I think the other thing which is the first for me is uh, I didn't realize that when I committed to this, it was for the whole week. I have to give lectures for every day for the next few days. Uh, but anyway, I'm looking forward to it. Today I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, probably some of the things that I've been doing in the last few years. Um, I have made some probably quite big changes in my own practice and my own life in the last few years. I've, I've been on sabbatical for the last three years. Uh, I haven't gone back into my practice yet. Uh, basically, I was just taking time off uh, from practice uh, and doing things that I want, have always wanted to do, but the practice does not allow me to do. The other thing probably that I have done in the last probably six years is that we used I used to do a lot of overseas work, Indonesia, Dubai, China, Vietnam, every, everywhere. Uh, but six years ago, I decided to pull everything back to Malaysia. So now we are 100% Malaysian-based, uh, doing only Malaysian work, uh, es especially mainly in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, so in the... Uh, if I, if I just launch myself straight into it now, um, this is the kind of stuff that we do in Malaysia. Uh, we, Malaysia is a tropical country uh, full of e existing vegetation, rainforest. But most of the time when we are called onto a site by developers, uh, and our clients are mainly developers, government, and very rich uh, landowner or house owner. And every time when we get called into a project, it always looks like this. Cut everything, flatten the land. We're extremely good engineers, so we can build all kinds of retaining structures. And then we can build on it. Uh, and this is very typical in Malaysia. And I was, I was not happy with the way we were building. Basically turning beautiful land into desert and trying to we need back again. Uh, uh, this happens in a lot of housing development, but it also help, uh, is happening a lot now in agriculture, where we are planting a lot of oil palm plantation. So uh, this is one of my projects, basically. It used to be a forest. It was cut, it was flattened, and uh, basically it was specified. And if you need to keep a tree, this is how it looks like sometimes. <laughs> this, is, this is Malaysia. And the way we built houses, a lot of our, our big houses looks like this. Uh, I don't know what style it is called, but I, pro I think I know where the inspiration come from. Some European temples or maybe their children's birthday cake. Or and obviously, this guy obviously, <laughs> inspiration comes from a very obvious uh, place. So this, this is the reality in which we work. But this is actually the landscape in which we operate in. In Malaysia, it's beautiful. Lots of water, lots of very clean rivers flowing down from the mountains. Uh, and in the year 2000, uh, we decided to probably do a little experiment. I've been trying to convince developers not to try to do things differently. We don't need to cut the trees. We don't need to cut the land in order to build, especially in low-density development. But most of the time, the argument was that it was too expensive. It's, it takes too long and it's not profitable. So I, I wanted to experiment by putting the money where my mouth is, by, by just doing some of this project myself, where I fund it. So this was the first project uh, in, in, make, in, in collaborating with working with nature. Because the belief is that if we take care of nature and we take care of the land, the land itself will take care of us. So this is, this is a project about one hour north of Kuala Lumpur. Uh, where we built a, a few houses, uh, very lightly touching the land, basically avoiding the trees. The trees are still there, very, very close to the, to the buildings. The, in 
inspiration obviously comes from the Orang Asli house, the, the indigenous people, where they, where they see houses not as a permanent thing because they, a lot of them are actually hunter-gatherer. So houses for them is just a temporary, temporary shelter, uh, lasts only for a few months or a few years. And it's usually very, very small, uh, just floating above the ground. Uh, nature is still respected as a background where most of it is nature and very little is actually building. We follow the same principle, basically trying to respect the background and making the building actually very transparent, uh, working with very little resources. I believe in actually using very, very little resources to make things because uh, when we operate in this part of the world, we are trying to look for mass solutions. And in this part of the world where we are in the tropic belts, there is still a lot of people with very little resources, poor people. And as architects, I think we should show examples of how we can be able to build elegantly without using a, a lot of cost. And if we can do that, more people can emulate and appropriate some of these uh, ideas. And our built environment hopefully can be better. So we are rely on things which are free. Spaces, likes and shadow to create patterns, uh, like quality, stuff that does not necessarily need money, whereas a lot of us are thinking about like, imported marbles and beautiful stones and timber and whatever, whatever else. We try to uh, not rely on those uh, uh, strategies to, to do buildings. So buildings are very, very simple. Uh, it's a communion, communion with the land. Some of this building, we are making some of this building as small as we possibly could, three meters by three meters where the building just sits very lightly in the land. Uh, if you need to put footpaths and stuff like that, uh, we try to float it away from the ground so that we don't interrupt the drainage systems because in this part of our world, including Bangladesh, the rainfall is so high. Every time we cut the ground, the, the water will wash it away. Um, using local material is probably part of the philosophy that we don't import material because uh, and, and the idea of uh, local material even include things like grasses. So in this particular slide, the, I, obviously some, when we start using some of this natural stone, we still have to import them from the quarry nearby. It's still in wharf lorries. So I was, uh, after that, I thought uh, to myself that we would try to just use things that which is on the land to build. So... Uh, Obviously, the cars drive in and they kind of destroy the grass. So this was an idea of using long grasses to protect short grasses. So the grasses grows and it's just protected by a little uh, wire cage. Uh, and the cars will notice it and they will keep away from the lawn area, which we didn't want the vehicles to go in. <coughs> so ideas like that. Building swimming pool where we excavate the soil. And the soil is used to build... Uh, uh, boundary walls and mud walls. Um, doing it very, very simply. We don't even ram it. We just pour it in in a slurry uh, to make it very easy for our workers. A, a lot of actually our workers are from Bangladesh. So I work with a lot of Bangladeshi workers and they are some of the most fantastic workers. Uh, I'll, I'll show you some of their concreting work later. Uh, but the idea is that we don't even do coping we just use grasses to protect the, uh, the top of this mud wall, which is quite soft from the heavy rain in, in the tropics. Similar, similar walls, uh, mud walls, and, and we took some of the river water and just dropped it by gravity, so they create fountains without any pumps. Some of the building gets larger uh, and it involves probably building ne near a tree or around a tree. So we try to save as much of the tree on site as possible. And then we built a second swimming pool uh, and also in wasps uh, areas where there are trees in. So we are trying to save smaller and smaller trees. Even a tiny little tree like that, we are trying to just design the swimming pool uh, around it. <coughs> it gives the swimming pool context, which I like, uh, and also it forces me uh, not, to, not to be driven by drawings. So now a lot of our smaller projects are driven by the site rather than be driven by drawings. I don't do drawings very much. A lot of our instruction to our workers is just drawing on the ground or on walls, very temporarily like that. 
uh, and just walking the site with them and marking out the, the layout of like swimming pool or buildings. I'll show you the buildings afterwards how we did that. <coughs> so it's about making room for the trees to come into the house. Uh, when, when we build some of the smaller buildings, obviously it's quite easy for us to avoid the trees. But uh, there is a demand for us to put in sl slightly larger buildings. And this is how it looks like. So we built the building over the trees. The, the small trees that you see here are not planted. They are actually existing forest trees in the forest. We just built the building over it. So this is an old warehouse that we actually bought from uh, a place which is about a few hundred me uh, kilometers away, brought into the, into the forest and re-erected, uh, respecting the, the, uh, the forest. The trees are puncturing through it. Uh, the other idea about, I talked about earlier about affordability is we try to avoid a lot of things like walls and doors and windows. So it's just a big shed over a build, uh, uh, a building like this. So this was the or original structure. It used to be an old foundry that used to smelt metal for the tin mine industry. Uh, I went there to look at an old bicycle actually and then the owner told me that, uh, and then I saw the building and I asked him whether if the building was for sale. So instead of buying the bicycle, I bought this building and it was slowly dismantled on site and then shifted to the site. It wasn't, it wasn't easy as the structure was actually very, very heavy. Uh, and we, we couldn't bring in very uh, large cranes and stuff like that. So a lot of things were actually hand carried in and also hoisted up. And, and we built the, the roof first. Uh, the, the platforms where the floors are were built later and they just went around uh, the trees that is on site. Some of the existing trees are as small as, as this. Unfortunately, this one, can't, we, we can't avoid it with the table, so we have to open a hole in the table for it to go through. This, this started off as my weekend house, uh, but then I, I find that a lot of young architects and young people wanted actually to experience things like that. So we started to actually uh, rent some of these uh, houses out. Uh, and with the blessing of God, now we, it's an industry by itself. Actually, I've got 10 of, 10 of these circle pings. If you go into the website, it's the circle pings. And it's all about experimentation with architecture in the inner city, in the forest area, in warehouses, in back lanes. Uh, and yeah, so this, this is how it looks like. Uh, some of the roof, uh, existing roof, we open up a lot of uh, skylight with acrylic on it in order to allow light to come in to feed the tree with the lights. Uh, some of the uh, existing chain block and whatever that you see here are being utilized back from the foundry. Uh, some of the baits are actually suspended up into the air in the daytime. At night, they come down so that people can sleep. Uh, a lot of the parts of, from the boundary, I haven't figured out a way to use it yet, so they, they just are on the floor now as an installation. This is the uh, gang tree that used to lift all the molten metal. It, it's still kept back, but it's suspending a dining table, which we can shift out of the place when we need the space to be a bit more open. Uh, this, gang, this gang tree still works uh, running horizontally like this. So that's how that warehouse now looks like in the forest. Uh, you don't really see it very much now. So this other project is uh, a pet project of mine. It's in my hometown of Ipo, which is about 200 kilometers north of Kuala Lumpur. I grew up in this town. Uh, it's a tin mining town, which has gone dead now because the tin mining industry has collapsed. So all the young people has left the city. Uh, it's left with a very old generation and very young people. Uh, the inner city is this bit here, which is what we call the old town. This is the train station. This is the, the typical British uh, padang, the field with the club. This is my old school here. So this is the old town that is separated by this river from the new town. Um, 
And in 2008, we got the opportunity to uh, take over this particular block of the city, which is in the old city. And we thought we would probably would like to use this uh, development to kind of regenerate the city, to try to bring back some entrepreneurship in, bring it back small businesses, and try to make the old city from being forgotten and then dilapidated and then later demolished, unfortunately, in a lot of uh, city uh, towns in Malaysia because we don't have a heritage law to protect a lot of these old buildings. So, and then later, we also took over this, this high-rise here, which is about seven, uh, about six story. So now we, we have this whole block of uh, development here. <laughs> Making it great again. Uh, so this is one of the building that is not protected by heritage law. It's a beautiful uh, building built in the, probably in the 20s. It's about 100 years old now. Uh, there is an existing coffee shop which I grew up uh, eating. It's still there. Upstairs is totally dilapidated. Nobody is using it. Uh, this used to be a cinema which has burned down. Uh, the new owners have put in a, uh, a ware kind of like a furniture warehouse which we took over to. So we started by just uh, going in and planting a lot of trees in the city as much trees as possible, as much greenery as possible. We didn't know what to do with it. Uh, we just bought it, we sat on it for a while. I got a lot of partners in my, in my projects. So we borrow a lot of money from the banks, uh, and, <laughs> and then we uh, kind of try to make it work. A lot of time it doesn't, and we still are paying the bank. We are in the red. But the idea was that just to gut the building, remove the ceiling, expose all the trusses, and basically we just put a few little rooms in between the trusses in the roof, creating a little uh, functional space. We partition some of the other, the lower, f the second floor, or the, the in-between floors into rooms, into hotel rooms like this. Smaller ones that is affordable uh, to students and backpackers. But the idea behind uh, a build development on a kind of like a heritage building is that I, I wanted to demonstrate this idea that conservation need not be expensive. Conservation need not necessarily take an old building back into a brilliant, refined uh, new building. The idea about conservation is more about stories, that people can see the history of the place as it developed over the 100 years. So the idea was if it's old, let it be old. We don't even need to repaint it. And if it's new, we use new material, we use new, new uh, construction techniques, so the steel and the concrete. So the new and the old is very distinct from each other. So in doing things like this, uh, I think we come to the con uh, kind of one conclusion that in our, in our making, uh, is that we do not need to really finish things. Uh, time will probably finish a lot of things for us, uh, especially in the tropics, where weathering is very, very intense and plants grow very, very quickly. So this is an example of it where this was the old building. It's totally, the, the, the roof trusses has totally collapsed, so we just removed it. We didn't even bother trying to rebuild it. We just built a new structure over it. Again, no walls, no doors, except maybe just a little uh, cage, uh, fen fence around it, that plants are allowed to creep on it. And people are very exposed to the elements. I think the beauty of our part of tropics is that our weather is so mild and so gentle and so consistent. Unlike the place where I grew up in, in New Zealand, I spent 12 years in New Zealand, where it's very, very harsh between winter and summer. That, that you have to do a lot of insulation, you have to do a lot of heating and cooling. In tropics, we should take real advantage of our, our kind of weather and just let things be very open. So that same building that you see there, this is probably about maybe eight months later. We're just planting one, two, three, four creepers on the ground, which probably cost less than 10 US dollars we created an entire facade to cover the buildings. 
So that's the idea about afford- affordability. Uh, and yeah, this, this is how it looks like from inside. Initially, the privacy is not there. Uh, sometimes the rain comes in, but hey, that's, that's not a big deal. As the plants grow up, less and less rain comes in. And if it comes in, we just mop it. I think that's the kind of philosophy, uh, uh, thinking that we have behind uh, making in the tropics. Making mistakes is also part of the things I think as, 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 I, as I get older and wiser. It's something that we celebrate instead of uh, fretting over it. And I think I came to that conclusion one time when I was walking a site with the interior designer for a building that uh, he took a big marker pen and he was looking at all the paneling on the, on the wall and if the gap, he's got a very consistent gap between the paneling and he wants it to be exactly three millimeters. If it's four millimeters or if it's two millimeters, he will put a big cross on the, on the paneling and reject it and the poor contractor has to remove it and redo it. So when I saw that, I, I realized that I was very, very disturbed. I think uh, when we build like that, it is very dehumanizing, especially to the workers who have poured so much, and it, especially in our part of the world, where workers are paid so little money, and they work day and night over time to build something, and then architects like us walk in and then just destroy whatever that they're doing and they redo it. So from that day onwards, I told myself I didn't want to take that direction. I want to celebrate mistakes and make mistakes into a, a thing which is beneficial and which is something which we can be proud about. So making mistakes becomes part of this whole idea of uh, just, just doing things uh, and just celebrating it. I think we've got many other ways in which to demonstrate our capability and our talent. It did not necessarily be so anal about things. So if, if you look at some of this structural uh, beams, right? We, obviously, we were lazy. We didn't check structural, uh, structural engineer's drawing. And you see that bit jutting out. It, dis- it disturbed us like crazy initially. That, you know, when you, when you bang a beam into a beam, it's just close that they're not punctured to it. Uh, and then later, we said, yeah, but... Uh, it's okay. We just celebrate it. We even highlighted it by painting it black. Yeah, so it's just like a piece of metal uh, things. So things like that uh, is something which we are trying to build into our practice now. Celebrating mistake. Uh, my last project uh, that I did, unfortunately, I don't have time to show it today. Is uh, a project which I did with my, four of my Bangladeshi workers. I have no more contractors. I got rid of the contractors. I got rid of drawings, and we were just building uh, things together. And of course, they make mistakes. They make lots of mistakes. But every time they make a mistake, it forces us to be more creative, to work together, to try to resolve it. So that is probably the, the kind of journey that uh, I wanted to take. Uh, so in this particular project, uh, obviously, the other thing it, when we talk about heritage is not just about buildings. It's about people. It's about people who have been do make doing business here. So we kept as many of the old tenants as possible, the hawkers that is operating at the lower floor, mixing them with the hipsters, the new generations of entrepreneurs, uh, and, and just mixing them together. So you see the hawkers here. This used to be a barber that used to cut my hair when I was a small boy. Obviously, he has downsized. Uh, we took over one of his shop and turned it into part of that hotel that you, that you saw earlier but we still kept a, a place for him uh, within the complex for him to, to cut hair. This is the mayor of Ipo that came and <laughs> cut his hair. So the old buildings all got turned into merchandising. Uh, this is another old building in there. The trees, are, which are these uh, epiphyx trees that are growing on building, we didn't remove it. We can live with it. We just have to manage it. The side streets are now occupied. Uh, we, and we try to green up as much of the area as possible. Uh, yeah. So, and amongst the complex, we buried a, a swimming pool that not many people know exists because we got a hotel there. We, we put in a swimming pool which is elevated from the from the ground. So at the ground level, activities are happening. But this is a swimming pool, and this is the swimming pool up here. And on the bank building, which is slightly higher, the, the six-story building, we have a rooftop like this, which we put in a roof garden. 
and now it's full of herbs that we plant uh, that feeds back into a restaurant downstairs. Uh, this is the warehouse cinema building which I talked about earlier being burned down. It, so it's a new building and repurposed now into a restaurant. This is my office. Uh, I moved into this office about uh, 13 years ago. It, was, it used to be a single-story house uh, like this one here. We removed half the roof, put a con kind of a long linear container building up there, and then put the roof over it to cover it. Um, and obviously, in our kind of tropical kind of climate, uh, a metal building and a glass building like that, the heat gain is tremendous. So we have to temper it somehow. Uh, obviously, we built this, this wall here just to block out the morning sun from hitting the glass. So, uh, and in order to do that, we use plants in a very architectural fashion. I'm a landscape architect, so I work with a lot of plants. I, I plant them and I kill them just to know, understand how they grow, how long it takes to grow. If you don't feed them in fertilizer, whether they'll grow, stuff like that. So there's a, probably a palette of about 100 plants that I have full control of. Uh, within our practice and every year we add maybe five or ten more plants onto that list uh, So this is how it looks like uh, Probably about two years later the wall that I talk about blocking the morning Sun is, is covered the roof is covered with plants. So then the metal deck roof is not so hot all the uh, site where the the, the late morning or the, the, the early morning and the late afternoon sun hits it, it's, it's, it's covered with a suspended plant like this. So this was, this was before the plants went up. So we have a lot of these plants which are considered weeds in our power world because they grow so fast. Uh, but but uh, it's a matter of how we train them and, and use them to our to our purpose. So the second skin of this building is actually all planting and there's no, no longer any sun that hits the glass and, and, con and constitute to the heat gain. Uh, obviously, again, we don't do doors and walls because uh, we, we do not have that type of money to finish a building. So a lot of the areas which is at the undercroft of this building are open. This is my office here. So the same plant that I grow, uh, covering the building also cover our cars and stuff like that. Yeah. And we can train them into a very regimented form like this. Uh, a lot of people have taken these plants from me and put them in their house and it's grown into a monster. <laughs> because they didn't know the trick of managing a plant like that. We cut it every four days. Yeah, it grows so fast. So we have gone into some of these larger projects where we use plants to plant buildings and in six months later, the entire building becomes covered with vegetation like this. You can see the planter here. So this is, this is inside my office. Uh, this is allowing a lot of light to come through. Uh, but basically, the, not, not the sun hitting the glass. Uh, a lot of our meeting spaces are outside, under the trees, beside the trees. Uh, and I think the, the other thing that is very big to us is that uh, when we build buildings like this, it's not only for ourselves, but it's also for stuff like this. So this little particular bird comes every few years and, and he will build a nest on the tree here. To us, that's a big deal uh, because it's about living in harmony with some of uh, the stuff that is uh, also re relying on our urban environment to thrive. The other thing which is important for us is about how we share some of our space. So most of the houses in Malaysia, we have a boundary gate or boundary fence along that property. Uh, but our, this office, we, put, we pull everything back into our property and live about six meters in front where the road space gets shared with our kind of like a garden space. The, the workers use, we build benches for them to come and eat their lunch. Sometimes we put up books for them to read. So making space for more public, we, we open up our Wi-Fi access so people come and access their Wi-Fi network here. Uh, 
This is a group of Bangladeshi workers that uh, that works nearby in the restaurant. They hang around the area a lot. So the inside of the building, uh, when we go in, as I say, has no doors and no walls. Uh, just small water features, just to allow evaporation of water to cool the building down a bit more. And we open up the entire ground floor of our office for the public to use. So there's a lot of different events that takes place. Uh, this is like a poetry slam uh, used by some of the local uh, groups. We have artists coming in to do their installations and exhibitions. Uh, human rights groups will use our place, installations. Making less more. Ah, so, yeah. So this project, I think, is about getting our inspiration from squatters' uh, community like this, where they have very, very little resources, but they still live in a very dignified uh, manner. Uh, I took this picture today. Uh, I visited this little. Uh, this is uh, where is this place? I just visited this afternoon. Korai? Yeah. Korai. Uh, I, I take a lot of inspiration from people who live in in neighborhood like this. Very, very small buildings uh, in a very, very harsh environment. Similarly, South Africa, where there's a lot of dignity involved as you get into the building. Uh, it's very small, but people take pride in their building with li very little resources of recycled material. So I wanted to do a project like this, where uh, I wanted to build a squat, kind of like a squatter house using a lot of recycled material uh, uh, and see how far we can push uh, this idea uh, of, of a squatter house in the, in the middle of Kuala Lumpur. So we started building this, this building here where everything is recycled, the doors are recycled, a lot of the materials are reuse material. Um, my wife is also a landscape architect. She built a lot of stuff like this. So these are my children's uh, Yakut drinks when they were small. They are plastic bottles that they don't last a long, long time because they're biodegradable. But anyway, they, within that one or two years that we still have them, uh, she will weave them into things like this. These are our milk cartons, our te Tetra Pak milk, milk cartons. our cat, tin cat food. So the idea is about trying to give things a second life, yeah, even buildings. Uh, uh, yellow pages. <laughs> this was done by one of my staff, uh, Farah Azizan. I did this installation where I just, instead of throwing away all our construction drawings, our A0, A1 drawings, we give it another cycle of life by doing this big cloud. It's very big. It runs up to almost two or three story high. Uh, but the idea is to try to recycle things and give it a second life. Uh, and with our eyes, I think we can be able to look at it slightly differently uh, into a, like a sofa, a telephone, uh, whatever, a little side table. So when the building is about probably 85% finished, uh, obviously I didn't submit drawings like this. When I submit drawings like this, the authority will never understand. So in this project, I took the risk. I didn't submit. I built. And when we were 85% complete, the authority came. And, <laughs> and they were very, very nervous. So the idea is to make them nervous. I think as, as architects, as people who are probably a bit more visionary, I think we have to make our authority very nervous because we need to kind of like push them and pull them until uh, they are a bit more pliable. Uh, so when we were com nearly completed, this whole lot of police came, the local authority came. This, this van has got a whole planning department from the local authority from Kuala Lumpur. They brought along one lorry load of demolition workers with heavy machineries. <laughs> they brought along a track, this whatever you call it, an uh, excavator, and they demolished. They demolished part of, part of uh, our structure uh, I have to take the next six months to re renegotiate with the city hall to try, try to get this uh, building back uh, because they couldn't understand what I was doing. Uh, uh, but finally, we managed to, and this is how it looks like. It still looks like a squatter house. 
it's, it looks unfinished, it looks un incomplete, it's, it's, it's like one of those things that you will see in a squatter community. But this is how it looks like. Uh, it's now a guest house, it's where we store our art collection. We have been collecting Malaysian art for the last 24 years, they are, they're all here. And this is the garden, a bit more established now. Malaysia has a lot of back lanes. Uh, so it's, it's back lanes like that, that everybody turn its back on. This one is a bit more clean, otherwise there'll be a lot of rubbish uh, on, on, on the lane like this. So this is a little experiment to see how we push uh, small houses, very, very small footprint houses, especially when in a lot of cities now, people are moving out of the city, they're moving further and further away into the suburbs. After the suburbs, they go into the next town. And all the young people are pushed out and the city becomes quite dead because there's very little living space in the city that is affordable. So we wanted to experiment the idea of how to bring people back into the city by living in, compromised by living in much smaller places, spaces, spaces that people seen as backyards, the, the unwanted spaces. So we did this little building which is at the back of, of this small little building here. This is also designed by another friend of mine, it's a bit bigger. But the idea was to try to build a small house that is openable. The, the footprint is probably only 300 square feet. Uh, it's, it's very common, um, I mean, in Europe and Japan and things like that. But in our part of the world, because we started as a very cheap nation to live in, we live in very big houses, and suddenly we forgot that land prices have gone further and further up, and everybody becomes un things become unaffordable. And then people start to move out from the city. And that's a major problem in our city, uh, in Kuala Lumpur. So this was a, tr a kind of little attempt to try to uh, reverse it. So we designed all these systems, uh, mechanical systems, where we can open up walls and open up floors to just extend the building by another two or three foot. And the idea that because we live in an environment where the climate is so mild that we can actually eat outside, we can entertain outside, we can, we can do all kinds of things outside. So the building might be small, but we have all this backyard space that we can just uh, kind of take over. And with a little bit of care, uh, we can actually turn in them into quite livable space. And then we went up to the roof too. Uh, when we get, get up to the roof, that's, that's the view that you get of the, the city of Kuala Lumpur. This is the, the cat ladder that goes up to the roof from that small building. And then when it comes to uh, uh, all these uh, very mundane things like wiring and stuff like that, I, I work with a lot of my craftsmen or my tradesmen now. I leave them a lot of room to move. I say, you just give me something which you would probably want to build and surprise me. So this is one surprise that he did for me where he did all the wiring based on the guitar thing. Every, all, this, all the wires are lifted up from the surface of the, of the wall. Using just very simple, it's a, these are just the connectors, the typical connectors. And he just put a PVC pipe to lift it away from the walls and the ceilings. So the idea was to try to uh, bring craftsmanship back into the uh, into our trade where we begin to emphasize labor rather than material in a lot of our project we spend so much money importing stuff from Scandinavia Japan America whatever that we got very little money left for the labor and I find that very dehumanizing so some of these projects that we are doing we tend to put seven almost 70 percent of our money on labor and spend just 30 percent on material. Uh, most of the time it's the reverse case. So that's the, I, that's the thing that which, which I, 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 try to, I like to do. So we have to resort a lot to local material, very simple material, but just using a bit of craftsmanship, leaving them to do whatever they like. This is not designed by me. This is designed by my, my plumber. I say surprise me and this is a surprise I got. <laughs> okay. Where you bend and twist and all these copper wires uh, into a shower a handmade shower. If you buy a shower head like this, it will probably cost probably about maybe US, uh, about maybe 80, 100 US dollars. Uh, we can make this shower head ourselves uh, with less than maybe 15 or 20 US dollars. So it's about 
putting the money where the labor is. We still pay them that, that whatever 80 US dollars, but it's in the labor rather than the material. And then they get more and more sophisticated with the, uh, the shower heads and the, and the knobs and things like that. They cast their own concrete knobs. So this, I think, this is the direction in which you would like to take in order to celebrate labor. I think labor is important. We, we need to celebrate it. We've got to give a lot of leeway to our tradesmen to do things. A lot of this are actually done by my Bangladesh uh, workers. Uh, I, I was some of the best, actually, uh, workers. Uh, unfortunately, they're working in Malaysia, not here. I'm going to send them back to you one of these days. Yeah, but, but things like this are, are built by them. Uh, this, you know, this is the, in, in Chinese, there's the Mooncake Festival, where you can buy a plastic mold to make mooncake, but instead of making mooncake, we make concrete, uh, but uh, tap handles with it. Uh, this was a set of furniture which we developed very long time ago. Um, basically, the idea was that in, in our part of the world where it rains so much, furniture gets wet. Every day it rains and you can't use it, especially after the rain, uh, when you don't have a piece of cloth to wipe the furniture dry, nobody uses it. So the idea is to try to build furniture that doesn't get wet, with very little surface area. So just using very common things like this to make sofas and make uh, stools and stuff like that. So immediately after the rain, you just got to give it a good shake, the water sh drops off, you sit on it and you're okay. And then we later, we actually are using the same technology to build some very big buildings. Some of these are uh, buildings associated with this high rise here. So all our facilities are under buildings like wire cage like this. Um, the other thing that uh, we like from all the experience that we gained from it, uh, we were now trying to build houses for the, for the poor, uh, for the indigenous people. This building was uh, built for a flood that a big flood that swept a lot of buildings away in, in Malaysia. Uh, we went in with this team of young people. We got this building built within three days. So the idea is to use back the same idea of using a lot of this uh, material that we are very familiar with. We were on site, sleeping on site. And over a weekend of uh, three days, I think, with a lot of students, to build this little boy uh, a little house like this to house them back. We elevated the building up so that the next flood, if it comes, uh, they are safe from it. So sinks and we did build walls using uh, this wire cage and infilling it with all kinds of materials. You can see bamboo and rocks here. You see the same stuff that I talk about going into their taps, their foundations. We use an Australian system where we pile the, the rods in as foundation. And just getting people to fold little uh, cages like that. And we drop all kinds of things into the cages. Rotted carpets and nylonians, bamboos, uh, mud balls, leaves, whatever. Just to fill uh, the buildings to provide some privacy for, for, this, uh, for this couple. So this was the building three days later. Uh, you can see all these cables here, that's, that's going to be all planted with plants uh, to kind of prevent the sleeting rain from hitting the buildings. Okay, uh, I probably got maybe two more projects. How am I doing with time, guys? Do I have time? 7.30. I've got two more projects to show you. Is that okay? So I, I'm getting into a more e e ephemeral stuff now uh, and, and some of my political work. Because I believe that uh, to do, in order to do things uh, uh, in Malaysia, because we are in part of a world where everything is political. So um, this was a project in which I undertook uh, in 2013, about five, four years. We were trying to uh, campaign for this lady here. Uh, she is Nuru Iza Anwar, a young, the young daughter of our opposition leader. Our, op our opposition leader is still sitting in the jail today. Yeah. So we were campaigning for her in my constituency, which I live in. Uh, obviously, during election campaign, lots of money are spent on campaigning. And the people who are in power have definitely a lot more money to campaign. So, and she, as a young person, has very little money to campaign. No money to print posters, no money to hang flags, no nothing. So we said, why don't we outsource all these things that you know we typically would spend money 
hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to, peep, to the general masses. So we, we devised this system and they said, why don't we just uh, make flowers? We make a lot of flowers and we plant them in public areas uh, as our campaign material for visibility and also in order for us to speak to people. So we got a lot of people involved, old people, helping us to sew, helping us to put the, I call it flowers, but it's actually a little flags, colorful flags, which I saw in one project, which when I visited uh, England, they were used in the botanical garden. So we took, I took it back and turned it into a political campaign. And little children were involved. We were devising all kinds of things which are colorful and kind of like uh, celebratory. Uh, we, don't, we didn't want to talk about politics. We just wanted to make our environment a bit more beautiful. We just want to have a, a visual uh, presence. So different people from different nation nationality come, the young, the old. We were making this for about over a period of maybe three weeks, and we planted about maybe about 300,000 of these things. Uh, we call it the flower of hope. Or plant hope, uh, the Malaysian Spring project. I was caught. I was. I was al almost detained by the police for doing this because at that time the a Arab Spring, Arab Spring was happening. Two zero one three. Remember, Tunisia, Egypt. <laughs> so we, they thought that we were trying to over overthrow the Malaysian government. So I was. I was being followed and I was being called for a lot of police interview for this project. But that is the kind of look that the. Because we outsource it to so many people, everybody did do different things, and there are many, many uh, different ways of doing things like that. So, making trouble is part of, I think, our journey as, as architects, as designers. Uh, we cannot actually be living too comfortably in, within our zone. It is about getting right up to the edge there and, and push things, yeah, including political change. So, obviously, again, the authority came, the police came, they confiscated everything, threw it into the, into the van, took away hundreds and thousands of our, our, or tens of thousands of our flowers. And within actually hours, within hours, we went back up there and we replanted everything back up again. <laughs> so this was became a quite a, a big event for us in the last general election of Malaysia. We, we, have, come, we have one coming up soon, I think, in the next six months. Uh, so we don't know. So we go, go up to very high profile places like highways and we just planted thousands and thousands of these things. A lot of artists was involved. They were designing their own things, they were designing their own dresses, they were doing up uh, the, the, the sign posts, the politicians were out there. This, this is our local uh, politician. D different people make using different, different colours and cloth, it doesn't really matter. We, we first started with some of the party colours. The the opposition party colours, but later people just took possession of it and the whole movement just, just went crazy. Some went into shopping complexes. This one was suspended off the ground, hang up from in a shopping complex. So at the end of the day, I think this number came up to about 300,000. Yeah, and, and it is about planting that hope for that Malaysian spring. Lah. And I think this will be my last project which I wanted to show you. Um, did I tell you that I was on a sabbatical for the last three years earlier? I did, right? Uh, so I was on a, a sabbatical. Uh, I, got, I got burned out basically in my, my professional life. Uh, I've been working as a landscape architect for the last 30 years now. So about three and a half years ago, four years ago, when I was about 26 years into doing landscape architecture. I was getting very angry. The project doesn't excite me anymore. We were doing a lot of commercial work. I didn't show you any of my commercial work today. Uh, but I think in the next few days, if people want to, to, to find out more, uh, I have a lot more of those things I can show you. But, the, I, but, but basically, I was angry. I was, I, was, I was shouting on the phone. I wasn't happy with my work. So I decided uh, to look within myself that the problem is not other people, it's really m myself. I have to get out of it. So uh, I totally quit my, my job. I passed it all. I, I, I gave away 80% of my company at one time. I just gave it away to all my staff. Uh, but subsequently, uh, 
the few of them also has moved on. So one has become a, a web designer, another one has become a full-time mother. So now I still have control of 60% of my company. But at one time, it was only 20%. Uh, so in that, in that period of that three years, I was just trying to figure out uh, what we can do. And the idea, I think, is about and, and, the, and the problem, I think I identify the, the problem, why I'm so angry, is because our client base is very, very limited. Okay? My clients are just basically three kind of clients. The big corporation, the, the public listed companies that do a lot of land development. The other one is government, which I don't enjoy doing at all. They are the big, two big generators. And finally, the last one is the house owners, the bungalows, uh, which again also I do not like to do because they are they are very very extreme end of, uh, of society so I wanted to kind of figure out ways in which we can generate our own projects how we as, pe uh, as, as a collective especially with the younger people that with our, our present age where we have internet we, uh, where we got access to a lot of information uh, that we can actually generate projects uh, this, I think, is one example. I got a few more, which I probably in the next few days, if people want to talk about it in workshops, I can share. But this project is in Thailand. Uh, it's up in the mountain of Thailand, in the very remote part. Uh, it's close to Myanmar. Uh, uh, six hours away, drive from Chiang Mai, the next biggest town. It's a mountain region, a rice-growing paddy, uh, paddy area. This is the town itself, very small population, maybe about 200,000. And we have a Hmong friend who has collected a lot of children. Uh, he's a, a forest monk. He has been walking the forest in that region of Chiang Mai for the last probably 16 years. And in the last few years, as he grow older, he's slowing down. So a lot of uh, villagers there were asking him to take their children from the mountain into the uh, town for them to get an education. A lot of these children have lost their parents because there's a war going on there between the, the Karens, which is Myanmar, and the military government of uh, Burma at that time, or Myanmar at that time. So a lot of these kids are orphans. He collected them. Very, very poor, extremely poor, uh, very little to eat and stuff like that. And he's collected about maybe about 30 or 40 of these kids. And the only place that he can locate them is in schools because they are from the mountains, very remote mountains. He brought them into this, to the little town and they school them there. But they don't have a place to stay, so they, at night they spend their time in classrooms. So we were called to help him to uh, kind of build a home for these kids. So I've got this group of very good friends. I've got about six of these very good friends. We are all from different professions. I'm the landscape architect. I've got Chris Wong, who is an architect. Uh, Joseph is a graphic designer. Yu Leong is a film director. David Lok is a professional photographer. And Mr. Lau, who is a professional contractor. So we went up, we looked at the site. It's a beautiful site. It's got rivers, it's got mountains, it's got paddy fields. And we immediately got into work. Uh, the, the monk has, he is a photographer himself. He's a professional photographer, totally given it up. But he's still been secretly photographing uh, the monks in the forest, up in the mountains, in the caves. And he did an exhibition in Kuala Lumpur where he raised about half a million dollars just from his photography, sales of his photography. He bought the land. He's got money to buy the land, but he's got no money to... Uh, built the building. So he called us in and we said, we'll go and have a look anyway. So we went up thinking that it was just a nice holiday, but got really sucked into this project. So immediately we got to work, started designing on site with him. And within th three days or whatever, we got the design sorted out. This is the building that we completed. It's a long building. Uh, it's uh, about 160 meters long and about six meters wide. And yeah, it's, it snakes along the landscape like this, inspired by my Chiang Mai ring, which I used to wear. It's exactly this, this, this form, this shape. Uh, we got the kids immediately onto site because they got no way to stay anyway. So they set up tents and they started working on the land. Beautiful mountain area. 
uh, they started to work. <laughs> a lot of people accuse us of child labor here, but I see a lot here in Bangla, in, in Dhaka today too. But anyway, uh, the kids were building their home. They got their hands dirty. They were helping us to dig, dig the foundation. No, I was just joking. We actually also use uh, a lot of local villages to help build, build this building. But we, because in this part of the countryside, there is no building technology at all. Building material is extremely hard to bring up to this very mountainous area. So we have to do a very, very simple building, which is modular. The kids are really playing. They are, they are really just photo op. After that, they were doing. So the idea was to, to build with a very, very big tolerance because of such unskilled labor up there and so little material. Uh, the, the modular form is just three meters. Every three meters repeats itself. So the first three meters, we make a lot of mistakes, and after that, they got better and better, and they keep building. And finally, this is the, the rough skeleton of the building. Again, due to my, my original philosophy where we don't spend money on windows, we don't spend money on walls, we don't spend money on doors, this building has got none of those. It's just a roof and a floor. Uh, and uh, a year later, this is how it looks like. The, the roof is actually a, a planted roof. The kids plant their vegetables here. It's totally self-sustainable. The, the kids are all vegetarians, so they plant vegetables and they just eat vegetables. Uh, they plant their own paddy. They have access, actually, they, they, they actually provide it to some of the nearby villages. So this is the roof that I talk about. They were planting groundnuts here now. And how did we raise that one? We raised about uh, 1.5 million. This is almost 400, about 350,000 US dollars to build this building. It's uh, 160 meters long by six meters wide. I don't know how much it works out per square foot, but we just based it on pure faith and we started the project on just day one a building and we managed to raise all the money at the end of the day. It continuously, it took us probably about nine months or 10 months to finish. We were selling cakes. We were getting all our friends to, to make cakes and we were selling them. Uh, David Locke, which is a professional photographer, he, took, he takes photographs and he was selling his photographs. And finally, after 10 months, the building was finished and we raised that one and a half million ringgit, which is uh, about 350,000 USD. And the kids plant their own vegetables, they plant their own rice. Some of them goes into templary monkhood. So the building is not perfect. It's, it's, you know, it's wavy, it's uh, whatever, but basically it's, it, what it teach, taught us there is really uh, the appreciation for imperfection. I don't go for perfection now anymore. I never call myself a perfectionist. I used to call myself a perfectionist, but I hate that term now. Uh, it's about being imperfect. I think it's the new paradigm in which we need to operate. Uh, so if you see the, the actual construction of the building, you can see rebars being exposed. You can see the cement bags uh, exposed at the, at the junction between the columns and the roof and things like that. But hey, that's okay. In the past, it bothers me like shit, okay? I will, I will, I will be crazy if I see things like this. But today, it doesn't really bother me. Uh, because what is really important today really is about all these things that is ha happening underneath here. The light quality, the kids, uh, and just the spatial quality of the building. Nothing is perfect here. We were using a bamboo formwork. That's why you see the, the ceiling has been so rough. So everything was just based on very rough sketches like this, which we sketch out the monk with his little kids, and the kids are in their beds, the beds double up as their working table, as their wardrobes, uh, and stuff like that. We just devised a very simple compression system like this to compress the, the, the bamboo to hold their beds and their furniture, their shelving systems, their clothes hanger, the ladder. So the kids just live underneath the roof. Um, they have a little shower facilities which is exposed to the sky so that natural light comes in. The, the water that is used to irrigate the paddy first also goes into the building for them to wash their clothes uh, and some of them take their shower. 
it's very clean water. We also built a few ancillary buildings to house guests uh, using very temporary material like this, which is the technology there, uh, bamboo and the teak leaves. Um, and subsequently, we also built a few uh, guest houses for visitors for them. So then the kids can operate a guest house, they collect the money and they, and they use to buy food or buy their uniforms or their books and things like that. So now this, this whole community is a, is a bit self-sustaining. Uh, they don't need donations anymore. Uh, we wanted to free them away from constantly asking for donations. So making is, uh, has many, many meanings I talk about today. Uh, I think making difference is also one of them, especially in this part of our world. Today, I, I went into a, a huge slum area. I think there's so much more to do. Uh, people are living in very, very small environment, in very, very hostile environment, extremely hot, thin shanty towns. I think there's so much we can do uh, with our knowledge, uh, with materials, with plants, with our basic uh, skill sets. So that, that making a difference, I think, uh, at the end of the day, becomes the, the, the very important things that drive me after the three years sabbatical. So now we are starting a lot of projects which are probably self-initiated. We don't need clients. We will f if the idea is good enough, people will fund it. There's big enough cooperation with CSR programs and stuff like that that we can tap into. As young architects, it gives us tremendous opportunity opportunity that we don't need to go and work for a big architectural firm. We don't need to become a, uh, you know, a, 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 a big developer or whatever. There are, there are also other now alternative ways, especially with social media. In the past, we don't have social media. It's very, very hard for us to link up and communicate and raise money or whatever. But now we, with new technology, I think, uh, I think we need to reclaim back architecture and reclaim back our profession. For too long, I think it's been hijacked by big developers. Because if I look at my own practice and Malaysian context, 98% of us are really serving only maybe 20% of the population. The other 80% of the population are not uh, being served by us. So the idea is to try to reclaim it back by using technology and new media. So I hope to leave you guys with that message today. And I think that the thing that to us that is important is not necessarily ne only the building, but it's actually the smile on some of these people, some of these kids. Yeah, that, that makes up for all the imperfection of the building that I talk about. You know, the rebar showing up, the plastic, the cement uh, bags being left in the concrete and things like that. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we are now ready to take questions. Uh, thanks, uh, Sek San, so much for this eclectic journey of your work. It ranges so many different concepts and ideas and projects. Uh, any question? Hi, good evening. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for the beautiful presentation that you gave us. Uh, it actually opened up a lot of insights uh, into the way uh, probably a landscape artist or, uh, or an architect uh, looks at uh, projects. I just had a few uh, questions. 
Say, for example, uh, I really love the way you have taken the Aborigin, uh, inspired by the Aborigines, that you know, lift the structure, uh, you know, from the ground uh, so that the fertile soil will not be spoiled and all. And I saw a very interesting way of you carved out uh, small holes to, you know, the trees go through. Um, there I had a few uh, questions. Say, for example, the, the, the curves that you have made, probably a tree is a continuous ongoing uh, a growing process. Okay, so uh, probably for a smaller trees, you have given a small hole, uh, bigger trees have given a big hole, but then I assume that, uh, I mean, you have created a live environment where the elements are alive, so they're growing. So once they grow, uh, do you uh, take off those panels and the parts and recut them and put them back? Uh, how do, the, how do you, uh, you know, keep those buildings uh, you know, how do you sustain those buildings? Uh, because that wildlife that is there, it's continuously growing. So how do you manage that? When the, when the tree gets bigger, what happened to the hole? Is that your question? Yeah, like you have a lot of structures. Like, you know, you have a dining table with a hole. And then, then uh, you know, right. like that you said that you always keep space for the this, this thing to grow. But these are alive. So, yes, yes. so once they grow, do you redo the structure? Or uh, how do you manage to yeah. sustain those structures? We, we, hack the we hack the structures. The, hack okay. the structures is not important to us. The right. tree is more important. So when the tree gets big and it, it fills up the hole, we'll hack a bigger hole. We have done that a few times for some of the, the holes. But some of the trees don't survive. But th that's not the point also. Some of the trees have died, but that's fine. Uh, at least we have saved, tried to save them. Sometimes the environment is just not conducive for them to grow underneath a big roof like that. But if they thrive and they get big, I, 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 I hack the concrete. Right. Uh, yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Uh, do, do we have... Uh, this one. We have one there. One taki. I'm Rashid from Suet. Uh, I find uh, quite interesting one character of your work is working with the craftsmen and accepting their uh, faults or wrong workmanships. Uh, when we are learning from our institutions, we go through some um, kind of serious academic uh, process. So we, after graduating, we cannot accept the faultness. So I think uh, we need to learn, uh, we need to relearn or unlearn our, our uh, uh, education or uh, craftsmanship process with the workers. So uh, you have told that you have worked 30 years in your professional life and I'm asking for you some suggestions for our, uh, like our, uh, my, like my, or my ages, young architects. Say how to uh, build up that understanding with the workers to uh, celebrate the mistakes or uh, not to panic with the mistakes, but how to uh, cope with that. Uh, how, what is your suggestion uh, that we should, uh, how we should un uh, build that understanding? Sure. Thank you. Sure. Uh, what I'm propounding today actually is not, you know, design is a huge spectrum. Uh, there are people who are doing very fine work, which is perfectly fine. I think that's absolutely important that they do very crafted building and things like that. But what we are trying to also, what I'm trying to say is that I think that spectrum needs to be broadened up a bit more. That uh, there is also a way out for people who are actually just... Um, doing very uh, unfinished building uh, and, 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 and make the, the design spectrum bigger. Yeah? So for, for young architects uh, uh, like yourself, um, I guess the, the, the idea is to find where you want to be in that spectrum yeah? uh, in your training. Obviously, I think in order to be able to, to do rough work, 
you really have to do the fine work first. Yeah? You, you have to go through that training. Because I think architecture, unlike a lot of other professions, is something which is, they say is an old man's profession. Yeah? That means you, you, it's not like an accountant. You become a master of it almost in, very quickly. Uh, there is a lot of practice that needs to be put into the work that we do. And when we start to hone that very fine, after we have honed the very fine way of doing, then we can start to, to let go. I think uh, that process is inevitable. So I'm not advocating that all young people just do very rough work and, and you know, uh, whatever. Uh, you still have to go through that training uh, because architecture, unfortunately, has got many, many areas. Yeah, you have documentation, you have management, you have design, uh, and, and, that's, and, and that's why it has to be an old man's business. If you go into management, you take at least three years to master management. If you go into design, you probably take a bit longer to master every single aspect of detailing, material, uh, understanding how we do things uh, uh, in, in, in the, the right way, yeah, or whatever. So I, I don't know whether if I'm answering your question properly, but uh, I think every one of us should give our time. Let's not rush into it, but but just be aware that the, the spectrum is very big. Yeah, uh, you can go either way. Uh, and what I'm showing you today is just uh, one way. Yeah, it's not the only way. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. I had a question about the buildings that you showed towards the beginning about the heritage buildings. Yep. Um, when you were taking over a heritage building, you created the new with new materials, yep. and you still left the old as the old structure. Yep. So you made the old and the new very distinct. Yep. Um, at the same time, you created a facade that's covered by the green. Is it almost such that you want to make the new invisible? and you still want to let the visible, the old part shine through? Or is this a way that you're thinking where you enter the building and it's still an old heritage building, but then you encounter with the new as a surprise? Or is, was that just a byproduct? Um, I, I really don't know, to be honest. Uh, because uh, when I visit places, historical places like Angkor Wat, the, the temples that I, I like more are the temples that n they have not uh, reconstructed it, you know the prangans where the big the big trees are still cladded onto the buildings. So, um, so the vegetation and the new and the old, I think to us is there's there's no difference. Uh, we just got to be comfortable. Uh, we got to be very honest about it. Uh, in when we when we do restoration project like that, that the trees needs uh, is part of the restoration project. Uh, the moss that is growing on the bricks are part of the restoration projects. Because the, the problem, I think, in which we look at restoration projects, especially in sing places like my neighbour, Singapore, is that they take an old building, which is dilapidated, and they build it back to original form as though it's built in the 1920s. They use horsehair plaster, they make it so difficult and so uh, extremely inaccessible for a lot of property owners to do, because if you don't do it, the conservationists will come after you. You must use uh, egg white plasters and stuff like that, which is very extremely difficult for us to do. Um, so when we talk about conservation, sometimes a lot of owners prefer to just tear down the building and build a new building, because conservation project is too tedious. So. I think part of our answer to that is that, hey, let's not be too anal about this conservation thing. At least the old is old. Let's leave it as old. But the new that we built, let's, let's use new material. If, you have, if steel is the... I mean, we, have, we are into an era where we mass produce stuff. So we have steel, we have concrete, we have bricks and everything else as our building material. Our ancestors don't have those material. That's why they are forced to use egg white for plastering, they have to use lime plaster for plastering and uh, or whatever. Uh, so as a landscape architect, I define a new material for building, is, which is plants. I think plant is a building material. It's just not a plant. It, it can be used for screening. It can be used for sun shading. Uh, it, or 
you know, providing privacy and, and a lot more other things. So plant has become a, a, a building material for us to redefine plant as, as that. And, and the beauty of plants is that it's, it grows very fast in our tropical countries. It's cheap. So uh, that, that now comes, uh, and, and that brings me back to my original when I started about appreciating Angkor Wat with the big trees in it. That's part of the, the whole heritage history of the place. So the big tree has become part of the, the heritage structure. Um, and we should not be just chopping down the trees and trying to build the building back into a, like a Raffles Hotel or, or whatever, which is like in Singapore. Um, I don't know whether in my long convoluted explanation answer your question, but uh, I, ho I hope it does, yeah. Um, we can take one more uh, question or comment if, if, if we have any. We still have some time. <laughs> Sexan. Hi. <laughs> can I show a few more slides? Absolutely. Go ahead. I think you should do that and then we can finish. No, no. It. I think your question is just. No, no. There was no question actually. It's basically, um, you know, I've, it's, uh, we have a, I've, I've known you, your work since 2013. Yeah. And ever since that time on, I have immense respect for the way you pursued your practice. Uh, you see in landscape and you have actually, in a way, constrained yourself with this idea of uh, using minimum material and uh, you know, giving labor much more pride and dignity that it really deserves. And um, by doing that, you have also introduced the whole idea of how design can be an intelligent approach. And a lot of that intelligence I see in your design, which is really wonderful. And it's, again, wonderful to see it and thank you for coming to Dhaka. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Maybe I'll just, I'll just give you a bit of a teaser what, which I'm going to do. I've I got I know four more days here, I think. Yeah, I think I've got four more days here. Um, can I just bring a few more slacks back up? Yes. So in the next couple of days, I never talk about my, actually my core profession. I'm a landscape architect. The, the one that I show you is all this mishmash of installation and architecture and uh, sculpture and whatever. But basically my core business is, is landscape architecture. I, I built a lot of uh, stuff in Kuala Lumpur, uh, green facade. So these are the stuff that probably I'll be dealing with in probably the next few workshops uh, in a bit more detail. Building landscape using uh, local material like concrete. All these are concreting work. Um, uh, underground car parks with natural lights. Um, commercial buildings with a lot of green uh, parks. Uh, uh, using old train stations. Uh, uh, rooftop gardens. Vertical plants, condominiums. Oh, I've shown this before. Um, I think Kevin was with us here, he showed this project. Uh, I was a landscape architect for this project where we, we tried to uh, bring some of the existing forests into a very, very dense uh, urban development. Um, I do a lot of structures like this, uh, which are structures to house plants, for plants to grow up onto. So um, stuff like this I will be showing. Just little follies in, in neighborhoods, uh, maize garden like this. And also, I think I will have one session which I talk about generally just making experimental short-term work, making artwork, uh, exhibition work, using plant materials. Uh, Uh, I do a lot of set design too in my early days because uh, we work with a lot of arts groups, so stage design and stuff like that also.